Hey everybody, well, I'm here with uh, my friend Will Hilla, um, the man with the plan, and uh, we are not 100% sure about where we're going to go with this conversation, but we're just going to have a conversation and talk about life and then go with it. Yeah, this podcast started with just a text message saying, podcast this week? Mm -hmm. Question mark? <laughs> <laughs> Question mark. Well, you were talking about wanting to potentially do some podcasting anyway. Yeah. So what was your... I mean, what was your interest in wanting to even start? What's what's on your mind, you know? Well, just sitting down and having a conversation just about, you know, Jesus and life and how it mingles and just putting it out there and see what it does. What do you mean mingles? Well, how life and Jesus, like, comes together. Not just, like, ministry work, but how Jesus impacts your everyday life, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I know that's on your heart and it's kind of this last year, it's kind of been on mine too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so like for me, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of areas where I've had to get really honest with myself mm -hmm. and, um, I think honest with my own, with my own faith practice and, <clears throat> and sit down and say, okay, what things do I really believe? I've been a Christian for a long time. You yeah. have too, right? Yeah. I've been a Christian for... 12 years. Okay. So, I mean, that's a substantial amount of time. Yes. And you start sitting down and you're like, okay, so there's all these different things that I believe, but that I think I believe, but do I really believe them or yeah. are they habits? And then of those habits, which of these habits actually align with scripture? And then like our own personal journey, maybe we'll use this as a springboard. Our own personal journey has been that as we started to take on the, the full responsibility of really um, doing what the scripture calls becoming the church. Sure. Being the temple, rather. Mm -hmm. um, and you start taking those words seriously and um, and taking that call to really become love really, really seriously. It becomes a really intimate journey. It does. And you end up examining different corners of your life. And, and I will tell I don't know how your journey has been, but man, mine's been uncomfortable. Because I start looking at myself and I'm like, whoa, I am not the person that I claim to be. Yeah. And then, and this, and sorry, that was like the start of this journey. And then as I've looked at those parts of my life, I'm like, I'm not okay with remaining this particular person. Like I need to go through transformation. And that's been what my, you know, what my journey has been, especially the past year. Yeah. I know with mine, it's been, so just a little backstory, you know, I got saved in Livingston County jail, January 17th, 2011. It was just springboard in there, learning everything about Jesus and just getting in the scriptures. And that's all I could really do. Hmm. Because, you know, the, the chaplains would come once a week, but then there's times where I just had to read it myself. And through that, it just developed. And, you know, of course, you get out and you're on fire for the Lord. And what can I do? What can I serve? So you just go to a local local church and just do it, you know? Mm. When, you were, when you were in jail, had you heard about um, the God of the Christian Bible before that? Yes. So what was, I mean, what happened when you were in jail? Well, what happened was, um, I'm trying to think. So how it all took place, I can go back to like, what, here's the thing. I'd go out and do my thing with the drugs. But before I'd go, I was leaving my daughter with my mom. Mm. So we'd pray, like, you know, Lord protect us, you know, because we had a, a Jesus background because we went to, uh, my mom drugged me to church my whole life. And then when I was able to leave, I left. So I knew about the Lord, but I didn't know mm -hmm. the Lord. Mm -hmm. I met him in this jail cell, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay. That's all I had. When you say you met him in the jail cell, what does that mean? Well, for me, it was, I remember this, because I was in a one-man cell, and I was like, if you're real, I don't want to live this life no more. Mm -hmm. I want change. And it was in that jail cell where he met me, and... It was like transformation. It wasn't like the heavens split open. It's just like peace came over me. Like mm. things were going to be okay, even though they weren't okay. So that's, will you talk about through that a little bit? Cause there's, um, I think we use that language a lot, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of unique to Christians. Like if we're, if you're in our circle, we talk a lot about like meeting Jesus and stuff, but like, what was like, what was like, describe the scene and kind of like what happened what did you feel what were you doing at the time and all that so what was just, going on i'll slide this over a little bit just guess right in front of your face right here yeah you can pull it too if you need to right so what was going on is i was in a one-man cell you know 
detoxing from the drug of choice that I was using, said the prayer. And it was crazy because like, there's all kinds of like, you should have did this. You should have done that. Just, you know, the conversations you have in your head Mm. said the prayer and then it stopped Mm. and I didn't get sick. What stopped? Like the voices stopped and it was just peace. And I didn't get sick, you know, didn't have, uh, you know, go through withdrawals. It was just woke up. It was three days I was in there because it was protocol by the jail. And I'll never forget it because I pushed the button. And I'm like, hey, can I go in the cell with those guys? Because I know if I went with them, I would get in population faster. So I get out of the the one-man cell and the door opened. And Mm. it was like the symbol is like, hey, you're good now. Mm. And then it really wasn't good, but... (laughs) Better than you were. It was a good... It was a recalibration time. Mm. I know looking back now, that was the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life mm. was that was that stay in jail at that time. Mm. It sucked going through it. But looking back now, it's like, yeah, that's that was the, the turning point in my life. So what was your, when you got out, what was your, um, you said you got involved with the church and all that other stuff. What was your, what was so, I guess, different after you got out? It was exciting. Stuff was different. It was just Everything was new. Like I didn't actually get out and go home because I had to get out and go up north to rehab because it was a part of the sentencing. Mm. So I went up there and it was it was I was in Sault Ste. Marie in the summertime. So I'm in this rehab and where people vacation just there. I mean, I walk. <laughs> it's it's cool how it all worked out too because I walked into this um, rehab and on the on the walls that laughing Jesus picture and I'm like, cool, I'm good <laughs> here. And then. Sunday morning, this crazy preacher just rolls up. Hey, anybody want to go to church? And I'm like, yeah, I'll go. Who are you? Oh, I'm the pastor at this church. We're going to go. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's go. Ended up working with him, and he baptized me. Mm. You know, he uh, he was instrumental in my in my walk in the beginning. Like, he was just, I just hang out with him. And, and that just, was, what city was that in? It was in Sault Ste. Marie. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, I guess I never put together the math before. that Your, your oldest daughter is how old? She's 19. Wow. So I never put that math together before. So she was seven when you were correct going through that. Yes. Wow. Yeah. My one daughter was seven and the other one was, uh, she was five. Wow. Yeah. And she didn't know that I was in jail until I told her mm. and she was like, what? You know, you're a five-year-old. Yeah. Did your seven-year-old know about all yes. that? She came and visited me. Wow. And then, yeah. What's been the effect of that whole process on your, uh, I guess your seven year old, like, because I mean, obviously it changes you, but there's got to, I don't know. She is, she's interesting when it comes to that kind of stuff. Like, she's saw obviously the transformation in my life and just different conversations that, because she was always in the back seat when we'd drive back from different events and she'd hear the conversations that we're talking and, you know, Mm -hmm. and just the church services and things like that. And she just watched the process happen, stuff with her mom. Hmm. that's happened so i mean we talk about it sometimes but like i ask her i'm like what's your relationship with the lord i'm like she's like we're good i'm like what does that mean (laughs) and you know she's just like i don't know yet you know i'm still on the fence with things i'm like it's okay Hmm. he'll meet you right where you're at Mm -hmm. so i don't really force it like you gotta go you know she's 19 right she's gotta make her own choices and all that she's gotta make her own choices and i know god saves households so I'm good. Mm. That has to have been a, an interesting process to have. I mean, because I like I think about my kids. Like our kids watch our process all the time. Yeah, and um, it's it's got to be interesting for her and her journey to have seen her dad go through so much change. She's seen some stuff, like especially with her mom. Like she saw some stuff, like like whoa, yeah. Like you can't deny it. Like you just can't. What like what kind of stuff? Well. Without putting too much of her uh, mom's business out in the oh, street. Oh, yeah, yeah, And we don't, we can, you know. But what happened was is her mom got involved in, you know, some drugs. And she was uh, since dying. Mm. And we went to the hospital and the doctors were like, yeah, she's not going to make it through the weekend. I'm like, wow. I'm like, well, we're going to go in there. And we're going to, I told her, I go, we're going to pray for her to be healed. And she's going to wake up. And she's like, oh, tears. She's like, okay, okay. We prayed. And then after the weekend, she woke up. She knew where she was, and they had the surgery. And now she's wow. alive and kicking. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know about that part of your story. Yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm finding out so much. In a, well, that's in the a, thing, too, because you, you, I told this story to to your wife, and she immediately put me on the stage. and did that. <laughs> She's like, oh, you're going to tell that story 
as a, as during transition, I'm like, no, I'm not. And she's like, yeah, you are. And then I ended up going up there. That was like the, the, the breakout going on the stage mm. and talking. So your wife threw me out there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. She's good at that. Yes, yeah, she is. What's, um, uh, so you've got that part of your story. What do you think is, um, in your journey now with where you are with spirituality and all that other stuff, what is, what's one of the most important things that you're focused on now? My family. Okay. My family, my wife. Cause what? Well, so can I, can I ask a comparison before you launch into that then? What was the most important and what is the most important to you now? What was the most important? I feel like I was chasing these titles, hmm. pastor titles, chaplain titles, in schooling too. And once I received all these titles, I'm like, okay, now what? Mm. Like, okay, I got them all. Now what? Mm -hmm. And then I remember I was driving home from work and the Lord was like, you're doing a great job serving my bride. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, what about the one I gave you? And I was like, ooh, pull Mm. over. I was like, oh my gosh. Immediately apologized to Jen. You know, just because what happened was is all these like church things I was just doing, I never once consulted with her about it, mm. ever. Never said, hey, is this a good idea? What do you think about this? Because, you know, we're one. So if God's telling me to go somewhere, he's going to tell her too. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, I've really focused on that now. On which part? On just communication? Communication, and- submitting it to her. Hey, what do you, I'm feeling this. I'm submitting this to you. What do you think? Yeah, that's cool. And then, if she doesn't have an answer right now, I wait. Mm-hmm. And I just wait. Mm. I don't like before I just move. Cause like, you know, I'm just, I'll go. Yeah. I need people like you or like with Eric that are like, hold on, let's look at everything. No, no, I'm just going to go. Yeah. Like you, you can come with me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, like- it's such a, it's such an interesting balance. Cause there's like, there's the one side of uh, like having the freedom to like, it's your life. So doing things. But then the also the other side of like, hey, like, you know, in your wife's case, like, hey, we're making real decisions here and we're a team. So like yeah. we gotta make this together. And I love talking to her about that stuff too, because like she looks at it from a totally different view and it's like, mm-hmm. ooh, that's interesting. Your, your I, I wife like is cool. I like that. Yeah. Cause like I yeah, I like how she, cause I was talking to her about some stuff last night. We were talking about love yesterday. Mm. Cause um I was talking with one of my friends from Colorado, Mike, and he was like, yeah, the commandment of love. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know. Then I was just thinking about that for the rest of the day, and I was talking with my wife about it. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's just submission. Like, we're supposed to serve. Mm. That's what love is, we're serving people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's what we're called to do. And it was just a good conversation we had because it's like she just thinks completely outside of the box. Mm. When it's, I'm not going to get a churchy answer. She's going to be like, well... There's this. What was her view? Just the, exactly that. Just serving and just like loving people. But you got to have boundaries too and mm. stuff. You know? Yeah, that's good. I was listening to uh, some guy that was talking about like, <clears throat> well, so it was another podcast I was listening to where they were talking about how the world is currently in a uh, recession of trust. And I don't know if we talked about this at all, but um, they were saying that, that you know, despite monetary recession ideas, any of that, that, uh, there's a trust recession. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, the other person on the podcast countered and he said, while it may be true that we have a trust recession, um, a trust recession is difficult to measure. He said, perhaps what we have more appropriately is a trustworthiness recession. Yeah, and I want to piggyback that off that because we were talking today because we have the social media era we're in where anybody puts a post on there and then anybody can speak on it. Mm. But that's not always necessarily the case because it's like you got to give permission. Like I know with me, there's certain people that can speak into my life. Like if they say, hey, sit down and stop. Okay, <laughs> because I trust them and I know they hear from God and I know they're going to give me the best advice. Mm. And along with the social media it's those boundaries are are blurred you know because anybody can because everybody's got a title or anything they're just like oh i'll just speak into somebody's life but it's not the case really yeah well and the idea that you know just because i mean we're all humans so we're all prone to error anyway right yeah so 
um, I think a, a difficult thing that I had to walk through at one period of my life is that everybody has um, a certain type of person that they give more trust than they've earned. And uh, usually that's connected with, like, probably as kids, it's connected to parents. Mm-hmm. And then as we get a little bit older, it's connected with you know some other person that we trust, maybe an employer of some kind. In the Christian world, it can be attached to the word pastor. Yep. In um, you know, politics, it can be attached to president or or a party or whatever. Yeah. And um, this recession of trustworthiness idea was that they were suggesting that one of the things that can really help uh, navigate trust is a healthy skepticism. Mm-hmm. And and a healthy skepticism doesn't mean like. Uh, launching into mistrusting everybody. It just means that you actually pay attention to what people say and do. Correct. And that when you're in the relationship, you're, I mean, so I started talking about this and then like, you're the psychology guy. Like what, what, where are you at in your studies on that? Um, I'm about halfway through with my master's. That's awesome. And probably going to go further with my doctorate. Okay. Just because I want to be able to have a voice in the psychology field. Hmm. So, and that has to have helped you a lot with navigating just the world, right? Yes. It's, it's a big thing. Are you on, shrinking me? No, no. I'm just kidding. I haven't. <laughs> I, I, I haven't yet. Just acting. <laughs> yet. I just, like that. Just active listening mm. and just like people want to be heard. Mm. People just want to be heard. Like, Nate, it happens everywhere I go, even when I don't want it to happen. Like, it's just like people just like, mm. like I was on a, I was on a job. And one of the main foremen just starts talking to me about how much he drinks. It's like, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, out of the blue, we're just having conversation, and they're just talking to me. And then another guy who's a pastor at a church, we're just talking church. Like, I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I go, there's a shift happening. You know, just, just conversations happen, and it's like... Real stuff. Even when I don't want them to. Like I said, it's just... Okay, we just... Like, I was... I, was, uh, I took your advice with the whole... Because I moved... My mission field is my, my block. Mm-hmm. I'm meeting everybody. So I'm going down, meeting people, and they just start telling me about all the neighbors. It's like, whoa, I'm just here to say hi. And we lived across the street. I don't need the whole lowdown. How about everybody here? I'll meet them. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that um, uh, you know, to clarify too, so when we talked about that, mine was uh, me just being in this arena of realizing that I'd spent so much of my time outside of my you know of my business and my neighborhood and my mm-hmm. family yeah that i'd built relationships but i was basically a stranger in my own neighborhood yes and um so for me like that it was, did i tell you that my dog got bitten yes he's got to meet the whole neighborhood now yep you so told me that story yeah so like watching watching uh our neighborhood watching community form in our neighborhood has been super cool. And I think it happens a lot. Like what you're talking about, like you are legitimately, which is weird that we have to have this conversation. Like you're legitimately just paying attention to people and yeah. showing them respect as another human being and yeah. conversations it, start to open. It's just like saying their name. Yeah. Just knowing their name. Like it's, you ever, I don't know if you ever do this. This is my thing. Maybe the evangelist to me when I go to the stores and I see their name tag, I'm saying their name. Mm-hmm. And they're like, How do you know my name? I'm like, well, you're wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> you're wearing your name on your shirt. <laughs> like it's not weird. Yeah. It's just it's just what I do. I look for opportunities to talk to people. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the tat that's what the tattoos, the lime green ring, the mm-hmm. shoes, it's always an opportunity. Open up conversation. Open conversation because it's handshakes. What's that say? Oh, you know how to read cursive? Check it out. And then, <laughs> you know, it's what you're doing with that really strikes me. That uh, one of my clients was a psychiatrist, and back in 2016, like right before, like it was like 2015, there were just riots all over the place. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that, but so I asked her. I was like, "What do we? What do we need to do to be able to?" bring some semblance of balance to the world. And she said, somebody needs to appeal to the civility in other people. And I think that's what um, connections do. I, I had a conversation with someone today. I was a little bit late to their appointment and I walked over and um, 
they were sitting there and I could see him being a little peeved off because I was a couple minutes late. And um, as I walked up, I was like, Is everything okay? And they were like, they paused for a second and their face changed from being peeved off to like kind of back to kindness. Like this is back in our relationship. And they were like, you know what? Don't worry about it. They're like, I was just about to be unnecessarily upset about something. Mm. And in that moment I was like, wow, this is like, this is the power of the human connection where this person logistically, there was something that had gone a little bit sideways. So this person was set to be upset, but because they got face to face with the person that they were upset with, like legitimately face to face, they were able to see the relationship. It just happened today on the before here with uh, me and my wife. I said something that was probably shouldn't have said. <laughs> and taking a shower, and the Lord's like, you're going to go apologize. I'm like, for what? And he's like, you're going to do it. So I just said, hey, I'm sorry for what I said. Instantly, the tension left. Communication started again. Yeah, that's cool. And it's just like, yeah, with that relationship, we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to bomb it. Mm -hmm. But you got to continue to have those talks. and. Mm -hmm. be vulnerable and work at the relationship and be submissive sometimes what's that what is okay actually this is a good, maybe a what does the word submission mean to you like well different times too like different like putting your needs above mine mm. that's what it, i feel it is because it's just like loving and like putting my wife's needs above mine i'm here to serve her Mm. Even doesn't even if I don't get the same from her. Mm. I mean, she'll probably watch this and be like, "What?" But I'm trying, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm tr grace, grace, <laughs> and I'm I'm trying something different because I've never done this. But this 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 never modeled for me. Interesting. Never because we I come from a large Hispanic family and it was never modeled because it was just like the men went to work and you know women took care of the house mm. and. It was never modeled. This this idea is just new, like this year. So you're talking about like the husband wife dynamic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. Like even you said, like we're equal, and I was like, you know, that's my yeah, mind because it's me, me and my wife. You mean? Yeah. When yeah. we we talked before, and you said we're equal, it's like, yeah, you're right. Mm. You're 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 absolutely right. We're not. I'm not supposed to lord over her. Even the even the conversations are different now. We just have conversations like, hey, you know what? I want to try and do this. I'm submitting this to you. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work out, it's cool. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's cool. There's, um, uh, I had a friend of mine that, you know, we were, we were, um, having a conversation and during this conversation, I could hear in the background, he like several times when we were talking on the phone, he'd ask his wife to, to get something or whatever. And at some point I was like, do you, did your wife just, get you anything and everything you want and he's like he's like yeah i'm mexican and i was like what i'm like what does that have to do with anything he's, he's like oh. i don't know what you mean i'm like Dude, your it's, wife it's real i'm like when you want like literally you want a q-tip and there's not one in the house you will send your wife out your wife will go out in the middle of a blizzard to get you like a q-tip i'm like explain this to me and so I mean, I feel like I understand a little bit of that. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Like that culture dynamic? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's interesting to me then. So your, your thoughts on. Well, uh, let me give you an example. What my, my grandparents had 15 kids. Okay. They lived, That's a they lot of kids. They lived in East Detroit and then they moved to Roseville and the men ate first. Mm. The sisters served the brothers and, and the men, and then they ate. Mm. And you could see how it, how it works now. Even when they're older, with my mom, my mom eats last. Mm. It's like, mom, sit down and eat. Like she's always. I'm like, out of everybody. Yeah, wow. all the time, all the time. And it was a big culture shock for me when I got married because I'm like, who's, who's washing my clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Who cleans this toilet? Because I, you know, I always came home and stuff was done. See, that's so real though, because that's like. Even what you were just talking, you know, kind of the where the whole world is in right now is a whole world is in this process of examining the way things have always been done. Yes. And trying to repeat it. Yes. And trying to and trying to figure out, OK, like 
this just seems normal to me, but maybe there's a different way that I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it's a thing that's, that uh, is happening more and more kind of in our generation. I'm certainly seeing it in people. I guess I can't speak to every bubble. I can only speak to what I see happening in the Christian world because that's yeah. where I spend, have spent a fair amount of my time. That seems to be what's happening on like every level. And people re-examining just what they are, where they're going, where they want to go. Yeah. Where did the... Um, I'm interested in this dynamic between you and your wife. Um, so how did you work out like boundaries like how do you balance submission and boundaries communication okay like they have to be communicated and i'm i don't like routines like mm. i just like i had a routine like right reading the bible i get up super early and do it and that just broke mm. and now i'm super like now what <laughs> so my whole devotion times like like backwards now it's like okay lord where am i going mm. and he tells me some days he doesn't and i just start reading but it's broke in a positive way you're saying or yeah what do you mean? yeah because i was so used to this routine of getting up reading this like i had the way i was reading it mm. and then i would just go on with my day mm. and then it just broke where it's like yeah we're not doing that anymore mm. you're gonna do something else and the thing with with me and jen it's like it's got to be communication like mm. we have to talk about boundaries we have to talk about hard stuff we have to include other people talk to like we we see a counselor and just like we have to just communicate yeah big time i think everybody should have everyone yeah not just because i'm going to be that <laughs> yeah. just, well, by the way visit mine at ww no I'm just well kidding. it's the thing too it's like because i'm big on like repentance and like opening up and sharing stuff and being real and if you're don't have anybody you can trust well this guy's bound by his profession this guy or girl you yeah. can unload and they can't say anything unless you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. Mm. That is one. Of, so one of the things that I've been thinking through with, um, so counseling. So, uh, one of my friends is a grief counselor and she was talking about how your counselor, if you see one in a perfect world is someone who knows very little about your outside life or doesn't, isn't really attached to mm -hmm. your outside life. But for me, that brought me into two different lessons. One is that it sounds, it always sounds like a good idea to get a third party that's not attached to your story. Yes. Cause then they have no investment in what direction you choose. And they're going to, and they're trained to, um, ask the questions. So you get the revelation. Mm. Like, it's not like I'm going to tell you what to do. Like you would see like, what's the perfect, the Sopranos. Mm hmm. Tony's going to see that counselor. It's like they're going to ask you stuff so you're figuring it out. Mm. So you're not relied on them to tell you what to do, mm -hmm. you know? And that's an important part of the aspect, too. Mm. It's just somebody to talk to, somebody that's actually going to listen to you. The, so, the, so that's the second part that I got to. The second part that I got to was recognizing that in my own world. So, my opinion of the Jesus of the Bible is that Jesus could have come, we've talked about this before, I guess, but Jesus could have come in any way that he wanted to. So if he is who he says he is, um, he could have been born into royalty. Correct. In the Bible itself, he was able to read people's minds, and uh, he said that he could have called 12, 12 legions of angels to burn everybody up if he wanted to. Yeah, he did none of that. So what that tells me is that Jesus had the ability to do this, but what he did was come alongside of humanity in the middle of its process to be a friend and an encouragement and salvation uh, to a group of people who were traveling along their own messy journey. And uh, what I've realized is that in my own world is I've not had, until recently, I've not had um, examples in my world, at least not very many, who were actually available for my journey. Mm. And it, it's been... Um, they've been available for my journey as long as my journey was starting to track with theirs. Correct. And like there was going with them. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I actually stumbled on a quote recently that started talking about how, like I over, I think all the time, like I'm constantly thinking through stuff. And, uh, this quote was saying that chronic overthinking can be the result of growing up in an overly critical environment. Mm. Now my parents were not overly critical at all. But certainly the groups, some, a lot of the groups that I traveled in were definitely overcritical. 
And so I spent all this time trying to figure out like, well, which way is right? Like, I don't want to get this wrong. Which way is right? Um, and I see a lot of people sitting in that, churning in that, like this obsession over, like, I have to get this exactly right. And there is a place for trying to figure out what's the right thing to do, but they do it at the expense of navigating an imperfect journey that is life. And, um, to me, that's really, really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with what you're saying too. Just like, that's how it was in the beginning with my Christian walk. Like, oh, I'm just going to link up with this because they've been doing it for a while and maybe I'll learn something as I go. Mm-hmm. But then as I prolonged, I was like reading the scriptures. I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't lining up. Mm. <laughs> this isn't. This isn't lining up with this. So then I'd go to a different organization. And that was like, okay, well, this is the same thing. So I'm going to go someplace else. And now it's like, all right, God, what do you got for me? Mm. Like uh, the prayer that I had the other day was, I'll do anything you want, but I'm not going to open the door. You have to open the door and I'll walk through it. Mm. So, and, sorry, go ahead. And it's it's like incredible just what's happened in the last two days. Mm. What's happened in the last two days? Well, um, is he talking about the house stuff? Because it seems like stuff that I don't know. House stuff, like learning more about deliverance stuff and just like stuff where it's like, okay, I don't know anything about this. Lord, teach me. Wow. You know, and other people like minded are just coming and like we're having conversations and talking about stuff like this where it's like, wow. And of course, the house churches like we should start. We should have one. It's like, all right. Like we. um like I have keys to two different businesses. Like we've met at one. I got mm-hmm. something to another one where it's like, I'm asking people for like, Hey, can we meet in your business? Yeah, sure. Here's the key. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's happened cool. twice. That's cool. It's like, okay. So something, something different is going on. And going back to what you said is we, as people, we study what the move of God has happened before. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we try to replicate them again. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, this happened back then. So why can't it happen now? Where it's like, Maybe God's doing something new. Mm -hmm. I definitely, you know, you talk about new things. Um, I think that... I mean, look what happened to Paul. He was Pharisee of the Pharisee. Got knocked off his horse. And what did it say in Galatians? He went back for three years, reevaluating his life, Mm -hmm. and then went into the ministry. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just reading how he, in Acts 13, where he went out. It was like, he was just hanging with a group, just learning. And then Holy Spirit's like, I want... Paul and Saul and whoever else was there. I, th- I don't think it was si- Silas. Mm. But it was just like, I want these two. And then they prayed for him and they went. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, fir- the what was the first uh, encounter they had? Like, they he somebody went blind. Mm. You know, he's like, because you did this, your eyes are going to go dark. Because the guy, the, the sorcerer or whatever was trying to influence the governor. Mm. And then he's like, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I like how that light turned out when you said it went dark too. I know. The um, uh, there's something you said a minute or two ago. Help me! Oh, I don't remember where I was going. Um, I don't remember where it was. It'll come back. You got anything else? Lord help him. No. <laughs> I don't. Did you, well, it's just. I know we talked about like we were going to probably touch on evangelism. Yeah. You know what? I actually, I wonder about though, too, before we go there. Now I'm thinking about this. So you're talking about uh, every generation has um, something different that they're drawn to. And I think that's valuable because I think every generation should, every generation should build on itself uh, we should get smarter. We should have access to more stuff. And every generation has different needs. Sure. Um, every generation has different wounds. Every bit of, and, and every individual. But, I mean, there are certain world events that seem to create very similar characteristics in certain groups. <clears throat> what I think is interesting now is you mentioned the idea of house church stuff. And, it, you know, my opinion is that that individuals are the church that Jesus described. Mm-hmm. So uh, I like to call them house gatherings. So yeah. I'll just say house gatherings for clarification for myself okay um but in house gatherings what do you think is there's a lot of confusion around them and uh 
there's some battling back and forth with the idea of house gatherings. And uh, there are people who do house gatherings that are trying to like almost battle like bigger organizations. And then the bigger organizations are trying to battle house gatherings. And it's a bunch of noise that um, you and I both know it doesn't belong in the conversation. Yeah. So uh, for you, what is house gatherings do for you in this in this um stage of your life i know for me it's just the intimacy around it Mm. like for one you're being invited in somebody's house Mm. and we're obviously like-minded because we serve the same lord Mm -hmm. but it's we each bring something to the table and we each learn from each other and it's just everybody's got a gift Mm -hmm. And we've all operated them. And it's just it's just great. It's not like a mirror of what you would do on a Sunday morning. It's just conversations and mm-hmm. just talking and just ironing sharp and iron. I and mean, that's how I do the um how I lead services in the jail. Mm. We just talk. Mm. Like I encourage these guys, like, you can do this yourself. So you guys don't do a traditional service in no. the jail? No. Interesting. No, no. Never. Okay. I never like even on even when I was in a even when I was in there preparing a message for, for Easter, it wasn't like me just talking at them because man, they got people talking to them all day, corrections officers, lawyers, prosecutors, all day. Hmm. I want to hear what you have to say. Like my my sermon for Easter was, "Who is Jesus?" And I asked them, "Who who is he to you?" Hmm. And then we went with that. You know, we went with what they said. Like I was preparing a traditional message, writing it out, and Holy Spirit's like, "Stop! Mm. This is what you're gonna do. You're gonna ask them, then I'm gonna provide when you get there." I'm like, "Cool!" Like that's 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 how I do the the services because I want to hear what they have to say because mm. they don't get heard. Mm-hmm. It goes back to what we just talked about: people don't get heard. Mm. That is a really you talk about being heard. That's interesting. The, I mean, the hearing and the being heard portion of a smaller gathering of people. Well, it's like it's like what you said with, like, you have to act a certain way on Sundays. Mm-hmm. Like, you get up and I like calling, calling it, you're putting on the Jesus glitter. Like, mm-hmm. everything's okay. We're going through real stuff. Mm-hmm. Life gets messy. Mm-hmm. I mean, look how transparent and vulnerable the people in the Bible were. They mm-hmm. had to write this stuff like... Moses wrote down the time when he was when he messed up or with Paul and it was just vulnerability and when you have a group of people you're going through that with it seems easier and you get healed mm. like you know it's like you, when you it's like like when you're repenting something I think we've talked about this before I can say it to God you know and we're good but if I tell you mm-hmm. you're gonna ask me I know you're gonna ask me about it I got guys in my life that ask me hey what's going on hey mm-hmm. what's up mm-hmm. I haven't heard from you in a while what's going on I, like with Mike Gibson I talked to him every single day at 4 15 mm-hmm. we're going nice. through Proverbs right now for six months and we just talk about it every day we talk at 4 15 my phone rings we talk on the way home from work That's every cool. day he knows everything about me. I know everything about him, and it's just it's just accountability. It's mm-hmm. just going through is like you're with your like your tribe. Mm-hmm. That's what you get from like a house church thing. Mm-hmm. It's like I guess they be coined as small groups too mm-hmm. or house gatherings, like you said. It's like when you get in those things, like you're going through life together. Mm-hmm. That's where I find that you know even with our kids. So you know, my oldest is twelve. My youngest is four. And we have four of them. And um, what I have found is there's a variety of things that Natalie and I have seen as almost replacers for the role that we're supposed to have as a family unit. And so, like, one example would be school. So, you know, like, should your kids go to school? Yeah, like, it's really good for them to learn. My kids are privileged enough that they have two parents who love them. And who want to be really involved in their lives. Not everybody has that. Right. But because my kids do have that, it's we're with our kids all the time. Like, you know, today we went out and my son and I went on a bike ride and I got to teach him one or two things in the process of living. And I feel like that process happens when you really get intimate with each other's lives um, more than just getting together for an hour or two once a week where you're watching somebody else. 
And instead, like you're taking the time and really getting into each other's lives. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, like, uh, the lessons of the Bible become real. Mm-hmm. Dude, I just, in this past year, two years now, I think it's been, I just realized like I've completely misunderstood um, being a servant to people and loving people. Like completely. Like I have I have missed it yep. most of my life. And when you start really getting that heart, which for me came from talking with uh, the people that I normally talk to, but a lot of it was talking to people who don't have any Christian faith practice Correct. at all. And I got challenged because I'm looking at these people. I'm like, holy crap, you love people way better than I do. And you don't follow Jesus. And I was like, I had that same. <laughs> that was convicting for me. I'm like, yeah, holy cow. I had this, that same thing happen because me and Mike were in Detroit. We went to this like hole in the wall bar. We just went there. And those people loved each other. Like birthday, they're having a birthday party. I mean, we got cake. We're talking to people. That community loved each other. Mm. Like if somebody didn't show up on that certain night, they're asking where they're at. Mm. I was like, I was sitting there like, oh my gosh, this is like crazy. Mm. Like we're just sitting there talking to everybody, you know, and just like we we're accepted immediately. And they love people more than sometimes you get on a Sunday morning. They challenge you internally. Yeah. They, they did big time. Cause I was like, wow. I mean, I was like, this is crazy. Or like even cause I also bo- belong to a, uh, a uh, carpenter's union. And that's the same way. Mm. Like they have each other's back. Yeah. It's cool. like all the time, like all the time somebody gets hurt. They're throwing money in the help them pay their bills. Mm-hmm. And some churches are like that, some aren't, but it's like, just to get the real, like, you know, Mm -hmm. like this is what's going on in my life right now. Mm -hmm. I need help. That's, I want to, I want to clarify that too, that what, what I'm not saying is, cause I've said a couple of times about like the small group versus whatever. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm not trying to say is that, especially cause this is going to be public. What I'm not trying to say at all is that traditional religious organizations are bad no me neither i i wouldn't have met you yeah i wouldn't have met all, <laughs> the people that are like solely in my life that are important people i wouldn't have met yeah if i wouldn't have gone to that it's just like for me right now it's more important to focus on my wife and kids mm-hmm and then if i'm told to go on a sunday morning somewhere i'll go mm-hmm. it's just well it's more or less even having just communion with God and like wanting to hear him. And what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Like I could go do this on this, but where do you want me to go? Mm -hmm. Who do you want me to talk to? What do you want me to do? And Mm -hmm. then waiting and waiting for him to tell me to have that relationship Mm -hmm. and, and talk, you know, you know, it's like even how we started this. Let's, let's do a podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, more or less focusing on relationships mm-hmm. and being real, mm-hmm. like intimate and real with people. Like, hey, this is what I'm going through. So I'm not asking you for help. I'm just telling you, just somebody to listen. Mm-hmm. Like I recently just did a like a deep confession slash repentance with a couple guys and told them the dirt, like the deep dark that nobody should see. And then when I was done. Like, it was just love. Mm. And I'm just like, I mean, my head, I'm like, did you just hear what I said? <laughs> what did you expect? Like, just rejection. Mm. And, like, it wasn't what I expected like that, but that was what going on in my head as I'm telling these stories. Mm-hmm. Like, these guys are going to hate you. These guys aren't going to talk to you no more. This is the last time you're going to talk to them. It was not that at all. Mm. It's not that. Because what vulnerability does is we think it's going to draw people away. But what it does is it brings people closer because it's like, yeah, I'm going through that too. I just didn't have the courage to say it. Mm. This is actually what you're hitting on right now. I think is a is a major um, uh, shift, is a major generational shift. Because I've actually heard people get up and give entire message. Well, like in this case, someone I've heard someone give an entire sermon about how you shouldn't tell people like the intimate things of your life. 
because then you'll lose friends. I disagree. <laughs> I know. I do too. I disagree. 100% disagree. 100%. Disagree. There's no way because I've seen it happen in my life where but, it's like. But yeah. I think the the conversation is important though because what it highlights is that there's, um, it is, it, it's one of the major miscommunications between generations right now is that the the older generation above us grew up in an environment where like the, a lot of them were not super well equipped to be able to have these conversations and like the men, like I'm talking like, you know, the seven year olds, like manly men, um, were not equipped to have these conversations. If you have these conversations, then you're a sissy Yep. vulnerability and authenticity means that you're surrounded by a bunch of people who just say, well, you know what? You're dumb and I'm walking away now. And that's not what our generation wants. Mm -mm. Our generation is like, is like, hey, I want to sit through this authentic conversation. And I think it's important to have now because we've got things like social media. And like you talked about earlier, social media, all this stuff that makes it really easy to get misinformation. Yes. And people are living in a world now where everything is a fake facade all the time. And so now, like, our generation is like, give me something that's real. Yeah. Well, Please. They're out. I know they're out there. They want it. Mm-hmm. They they want something that's real, and they're searching for anything that can give it to them, mm-hmm. whether it be relationships or just different forms of religion or different just different stuff in general. Mm-hmm. They they want the supernatural and they want to experience it, mm-hmm. but they just don't know how, mm-hmm. and they want somebody to to hear and to hear them. They just like going back, they just want to be heard. Mm-hmm. Like I was in on Sunday, I was in. Um, I had a 19 year old kid in one of my classes in the jail and he just wanted to be heard. Mm. He just wanted to tell me everything. He's cussing. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, come on, dude. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Just talk. Mm-hmm. You want to be heard. The stuff going on in your life, it's whatever. What's it like talking to a, to a teenager in jail? Is it any, well, okay, let me say it a different way. Is talking to a teenager any different than talking to someone who's like 30 or 40? Yes. Okay. Big time. What kind of difference is because the nineteen the the kids there they just they're just so lost I th- I think like this gener this generation's looking for something and they're looking all in the wrong places like the twenty year olds and and younger mm. you know because I have a uh, I have seven kids my oldest is twenty my youngest is four mm. I have my teenagers are twenty nineteen eighteen and seventeen and just watching them just grow up just like. I was like, oh my gosh, like it's, I mean, granted they, they're doing a lot better than I did at that age, <laughs> <laughs> but they're still facing their stuff, but they're facing, but they want to be heard. Like I had a deep conversation with my 17 year old the other day, just about life mm. and about how she feels and what's going on and about gaslighting and not being heard. Mm. And it's cool that my kids can come talk to me about that kind of stuff. Cause I never That's had that. Cool. I never had that with my dad. Cause it was like the whole thing. Like, Oh, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. We just go fishing or hunting or we drink beers or, yeah, you know, we just, you know, do stuff like that. We don't talk. Mm. They do. We do now. Cause you know, I, I initiate, I'm like, Hey, we got to have a relationship here. We got to talk. You know. Do you know gaslighting was the word of the year last year? Was it? <laughs> yeah. I know we had some conversations about it oh, via text and different articles and stuff. Well, just crazy like to, to think about like that you can have a conversation at 19, 20 years old with your parent about a topic like gaslighting. To me, again, just speaks to this thing like, man, like each generation has access to so much more information oh, yeah. and so many more tools to be able to do life I guess maybe a little bit easier. I don't know if that's. But then they still for. ask me, like my teen, like, "Hey, what about this?" I'm like, "Google it." <laughs> and then my one is like, "Oh, you're older than Google," so you're, I'm like, ah, okay. uh, "Yeah, you're older than Google. You're the original Google." <laughs> right, and I'm like, "Just Google it. What are you talking about?" Google. Next, you just say, "What Chat GPT it?" Yeah, it's like, man. But yeah, it's like my heart goes out to the kids and just the younger generation in general because it's like. Mm-hmm. They need help. They need mentorship. They need discipleship. They need to, you know, Mm -hmm. see what's going on and somebody to come alongside them. Mm -hmm. This is where I think that, you know. Especially um, men. mm. I mean, I think the ladies do it better than we do Mm -hmm. with each other. Like, 
men need to start opening up and be vulnerable and you know talk there's um uh i was listening to another thing that was talking about how like the you know there's a lot of tension in the world right now Mm -hmm. and i mean i feel like anybody at any given time at any podcast could say the same thing like i feel like everybody there's always tension but per usual there's tension in the world Mm -hmm. and i was listening to the opinions of a few guys who were economists or something like that and they're saying that the atmosphere was very similar in the 1890s to what it is now very similar apparently um all this stuff the mistrust all that other stuff yeah and he was saying that uh america pulled itself out of it and the way that they did it was by going small and uh you know people tried to fix things from the top didn't really work but what happened was people took their personal responsibilities and they started going into their homes and they started taking up responsibility in their workplace and all this other stuff to be the change personally yeah. and it actually trickled up and uh even when you're talking about like kids and generations what i think about is this is the value of people getting involved with their communities and when i say getting involved i just mean like showing up yeah yeah just, like it's not just big showing thing. up just hey i'm here you don't have to set up a tent with cookies nope. and ice cream and stuff like you just like being a normal person or walking out of your front yard and saying hi waving yeah. to your neighbor yeah like i did on the before hey matt how's yeah. your dog doing I'm doing good the cone comes off next week great see you later <laughs> the story hits too close to home <laughs> but, <laughs> right no and saying hi to my other neighbor and you know because yeah. my wife's like not like me like she's like you go talk to him I'll, <laughs> I'll stay in the house you go extra i over love there. how kids operate too because we like i said we just moved in this new neighborhood mm-hmm. and we're in the backyard and i'm with my three kids and a group of kids walks over hey i'm a kid you're a kid let's play mm-hmm. see ya that's cool and the parents, like the same same thing you had, parents, not believers, mm-hmm. great parents, mm-hmm. kids over. I'm like, you don't mind, like, because I, I grew up in the country, so I don't know how it works with the whole city. Yeah, to be able to run inside, you mean? Yeah, and I'm like, so what do I do? She's like, well, you can hang out or just go home, and mm-hmm. I'll bring her by later. I'm like, okay. So I just went home, and just the kids are out there playing, and that's cool. It's like, okay, this is. Something different. It's what's needed. Just sh- showing up. That's very cool. Being available is a skill. That's you know, what this brings me to again is, you know, some of the things that we're talking about are so basic to so many people. Um, for me, this concept is, I think what it's really been is the process of popping my own bubble. And in my, it's going to be different for everybody, but in my world, it's been popping my religious bubble. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is like the idea that like, hey, you as another human being should be involved, have the opportunity to be involved with people in your neighborhood. That should be a normal part of your life. Like that's such a normal thing to yeah, say. I mean, yeah, it's. But for me, it was like, OK, pop the bubble. Get involved with the entire world. Yeah. It's just big for me. Yeah. Um, there's a. We're. We're an hour in. Um, do you have maybe one more topic you want to hit on, and, or you want to? Well, yeah, okay. evangelism. Okay. It's changed tremendously because we've had conversations about this. You know, I'm kind of leaning more towards your your view on it now. Okay, you're more on like because I just a little backstory real fast. 2020 to 2022 hit the streets. Mm. Words of knowledge, healings, miracles. I went from lansing to detroit to flint to vegas Mm. just to do this stuff and now it's like that stuff's good but it's like hey jesus is real here here i'm introducing you to him now let's have community let's talk Mm. let's have conversations here's my number if you need anything Mm -hmm. you know it's just like i'll still go out on events and still plan them but like I want to talk with people. Mm. I want to see where they're coming from. Why Why are you doing this? Like the kid back to the 19-year-old kid, he was telling me about all this drugs he's using. I'm like, listen, dude, those are all symptoms to the deeper problem. Mm. I don't, I'm not concerned about your meth use or whatever, even your weed use now. Mm-hmm. Something deeper is going on. What is it? He was mm-hmm. like, I don't know. 
Mm. I'm like, because nobody's ever asked you that question before. He's like, nope. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I'll see you next time. We'll talk about it again. <laughs> it's just it's building relationships. Because like I said, I two years nonstop. Then this past year, nothing. Mm. And they just come to me when it's and we just have conversations and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, I don't have to have deep prayers or, you know, anything else. It's like, hey, I just want to they just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. Like, because we had, I mean, I could tell you about all the crazy things we've seen in Vegas on Fremont Street and just whatever else. But like, just being love, mm -hmm. going out and being love. All right, Lord, I'm going to enjoy you today. Let's go have some fun. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's cool. What is it when you connect with people? like that what is it um i guess what's the meaning for you why is it meaningful for you just so they can meet the person who uh, who's lord to me mm. just so they can have a glimpse of them just to just you know even a piece or whatever god wants to do with the communication mm -hmm. that's why like i said the tattoos it's just we're gonna talk mm -hmm. you know and then i guess for me going out and doing it I never did it before. Mm. Like, cause I, I got the title of outreach pastor. I'm like, I never outreached in my life. I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing. I'll never forget this. Let me tell this story. Then we can move on. I was at the Capitol first outreach of an ever I've ever done. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like I am not walking up to anybody and praying for him. Mm -hmm. And this young man who I met there, Roman, he just walks up to somebody. He's like, Hey, I'm a believer in Jesus. I believe in prayer. What can I pray for you? I'm like, that was easy. Mm. This kid's 19 years old and he's bold like this. I can do this. And it was like the scales fell off. And I felt, I saw these people as Jesus sees them. No matter what they believe, what group they're part of, what they claim, what side of government, I don't care. Mm. I just want to love you. Mm -hmm. How can I love you? I don't, I don't care what you do. I don't care anything. Just how can I love you? Mm. Let's have a conversation. Why are you... What's going on in your life? Let me tell you about how Jesus saved my life. Mm -hmm. That's it. That makes me think about, um, I, w I really, Ed Silvoso, you familiar with him at all? Mm -mm. So Ed Silvoso was, uh, uh, some of his information was, was majorly influential in my life. And um, one of the things that he described, this is back when I was trying to figure out, do I continue to work for a church or do I go into business? And at the time, I thought that it was just, I could only do one or the other. Yeah. And so I got, you know, hooked up into some relationships with some different people and then started going through some Ed Silvoso stuff. It was really freeing to me. But one of the things that Ed did is he, he simplified the idea of ministry. Because to me, the idea of ministry was just tell people about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But he started talking about how there are several different types of poverty that people live in. And they were, I'm not going to get them all. I think there were like five, but it was financial poverty, spiritual poverty, uh, motivational poverty, and relational poverty. And I'll just stop there. But what it helped me to understand was if you're going to, to me, ministry just became meeting needs. So yeah. I'm going to meet needs. How do you meet needs? You fulfill whatever area of, you fill whatever area that someone's impoverished in. And so I want to talk about like probably the number one place that people have poverty in their lives now is relationships, real, correct, authentic, deep relationships yes. with people who care, genuinely care. They're not trying to get you to think what they think or feel what they feel. It's just one human connecting with another. Correct. Human. Yeah. And that's the thing too. Like I had that conversation with the young man I'm mentoring on the way here. He's like, you are the only one that reached out to see how I'm doing. Mm. Cause usually it's me doing it and I stopped mm. and you're the only one mm. like, cause I call him on Easter cause I know his parents are on a cruise. I'm like, Hey, what are you doing today? He's like, I'm going to my grandparents. I'm like, all right. Cause I was going to invite you over if you weren't doing anything or like, I haven't talked to like, I text him today. I'm like, so you can't talk to me at 4 PM. So your solution is not to call at all. <laughs> And then it broke into What's the up, bro. Yeah. And then it broke into conversations and everything else and just back to whatever. It's like you gotta make yourself available. Mm -hmm. But with boundaries. Mm -hmm. You just have to. Mm -hmm. Like me being here right now is out of my comfort zone because like I said I got here. It's late for me. <laughs> yeah. Forty one years old. I wake up at four thirty <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> it's late, but it, 
you got to do this because this is going to impact people. Mm -hmm. Like we're having a com a real conversation. Mm -hmm. No topics. We're just friends talking about stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's going to set a lot of people free. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just by what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's super important to have. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we see a lot of people that just go through the motions. Like going back to what I said, I don't like routines because it's just like I get stuck in them. And they become Lord because I just do the same thing over. You got to break them. Mm -hmm. you have to have the heart and the hard conversations too because that's when you grow mm -hmm. you know that's when you grow god shows up during the storms or when you need you know you have to be desperate i remember this is how i put it like when i was in my addiction i was desperate every single day to get the drug of choice that i wanted mm. like it didn't matter it didn't matter who I hurt, I needed that. So I applied that with Jesus. I'm desperate for him every single day. Mm. I have to be. He's the source of my life. He's, the, he's given me everything that I have mm -hmm. and led me through everything. Everything that I have, everything that I don't have. You know, and it's just, just him bringing, like, I remember your, your wife sent me and Eric a text yesterday about something. I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is the door you're opening. Mm. This is incredible. I have no idea how to do it, but you're going to teach me, so we're good. Mm. Like I, I remember I was working on this thing at work, and then I get the text through my hair. I'm like, as Natalie says. And I was <laughs> like, I was like, whoa, this is really going to happen. This is awesome. Mm. <laughs> and just, just yielding. And okay, you do it. Mm. You know, because we sometimes get in the way a lot. Mm. A lot. And I, I thought like you too, it's either one or the other, but it's like, I hang out with a group of people that are so like, they don't know and they work so hard and they just drink or, you know, I mean, they're building the infrastructures of America mm. and they're unheard. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, oh, just work harder. Just do more. What, okay. do you, what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on them? specifically that you're talking about my thoughts on them is like they get stuck in the routine their their value is what they can give mm. and once they start i've watched it so many times with the older generation the older guys that are retiring they don't know how to retire they don't know how to because they've been doing this for so long i mean you're asked to like essentially if you come in at 20 you're you're asked to give them 42 years of your life before you can retire with full yeah, pension a and everything that's a lot of time that's somebody's identity is found in that mm -hmm. like what they do like i'm a carpenter it's like no that's what you do mm -hmm. who are you and it stumps them all the time those are the people that you're with all day long all day all day carpenters electricians plumbers laborers mm. all day all day talking with these guys and you know it's you get some good conversations and you also got to learn how to filter some other conversations <laughs> out and some other stuff. It's like, that's where I want to be. That's, that's who Jesus spent the first years of his life with mm -hmm. before he stepped into his ministry. He was as a carpenter. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine with real people, with real people, with real people that had real issues and, just like when he was in his ministry, real issues. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, man, I want to go out and just meet people and talk with them and just build communications and talk and have conversations with them. Even for a moment, it doesn't matter. Well, it'd be interesting to see what your, you know, what your, um, where your journeys take you with you guys moving in this new house. You've been in do for oh, two man, days I though. It. I love it. It's been here for a week and I love it. Nice. I love it. I love being in downtown. I love like me and the kids. We will like before we, I came here, we went to the park That's cool. every day. Let's go for a walk, dad. Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. Or let's go to the park. They go to the park and I sit there and watch them. And Jen gets some time. Cause she's always with the kids. Like we just came off of, uh, the kids were sick. All of them got sick at the end. She's just a trooper. Like, and I've been gone every night this week. I know, Last night I had that house that house gathering meeting, and then I don't know where I was Monday and then here. Mm -hmm. So it's like she's been a trooper yeah. through the whole thing. So yeah. thanks, Jen. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think I'm out of things to talk about. Yeah, We've got a lot of stuff in here. 
to be continued. It's a good conversation for the first one. Yeah. So I'm open for many more. Maybe we can just get into a big studio and there we go. This will be our, it will be content provider. Who knows? <laughs> who, who knows? All right. Well, good. I guess we're out. <laughs>